Cut it. Okay. Oh, wait, I should wait. Okay. So, last time we talked about energy, and we talked about how we can move from one type of energy to the other, and energy is never lost or gained. Energy is just transformed from one type to another. But we never talked about how to actually calculate the amount of energy within a given system. Now, in order to do that, you have to remember that there are three different, or really four different types of energy that any system could have. Um, a system could have gravitational energy. And gravitational energy, again, is any time that something is up off the ground and is able to fall, then that thing has gravitational energy. We have kinetic energy. And again, kinetic kind of, that is movement, the action of actually doing something. We have some movement, we have some kinetic energy. And lastly, we have this type called elastic energy. The energy of something that has been deformed but wants to return to its original shape. So we've got elastic energy, we've got kinetic energy, we've got gravitational energy. And the fourth kind that I almost forgot is heat heat energy, and we're not going to talk about the equation for heat energy today. We're, we have to do a little more of a couple of other things before we get there. But let's break this down. What actually determines the amount of gravitational energy something has? Let's say that I've got two markers that are the same mass. If I hold one marker here and the other marker here, which one do you think has more gravitational energy? It's this one. Right? It's higher up, meaning it has more distance to fall, so that distance can be converted into energy, into kinetic energy. So one of our variables to determine what my gravitational energy is, energy due to gravity, has got to be height. If I had this marker, and I had these very much heavier set of tongs, and I were holding them at the same height, these would actually have more energy. So the second thing, the second variable within our energy equation is mass. If you lift something very heavy above your head and you lift something very light above your head, one of those two will have more energy, and it's the one that is more massive. Lastly, we have to think about what is actually giving these things energy. What is allowing these things to move? And, of course, that's gravity. So if we want to know how much gravitational energy something has, we can take its mass, we multiply it by the acceleration due to gravity, and lastly we multiply both of those values by the height. Good. So this is one equation down. Eg is equal to mgh. And I remember this because it's Mass General Hospital. I don't know why I remember it that way, but I've always remembered it that way. Um, so it's Mass General Hospital. Kinetic energy. The energy of motion. Of motion. The energy of motion. It's the faster something goes, the more kinetic energy it has stored within it. So the faster something goes... That means that it has something to do with velocity. And I want you to think, when we're thinking about energy, we want to think about how this can be converted into motion. A bullet, obviously, will have a lot of energy. It's moving really incredibly fast. In fact, speed is so important that I'm going to square it. V squared, velocity squared. Speed, again, is, is really the most important part about this. But what do you think would have more energy? A bullet going at 100 miles an hour, or an elephant going at 100 miles an hour? Obviously, it's the elephant. Um, and that gives us our second variable within our energy kinetic, leaving us with this equation here. Ek can be calculated using one-half the mass times velocity squared. This is mass. This is velocity. Elastic energy is a little bit more strange. Compared to these other two, it's 
very, very specific to whatever you are stretching. Some things want to be stretched more, or some things want to be stretched not at all. So if I were to compare two things like a slinky, which I can stretch really super easily, and a car shock, which is really super difficult to stretch, those things are inherent in the object itself. One material is just more stretchy or less stretchy than the other thing. That gives us a constant. We call this constant K. K is just how stretchy a given material is. Here I have a rubber band. It is pretty stretchy. I can stretch it fairly far. Um, if this were a, a thicker rubber band, it would be more difficult to stretch this. That would give me a higher K value. So K is, I'm going to call it my stretchiness constant. The second thing that I have to consider is how far I'm stretching it. This distance right here is how far I've stretched it. If I stretch it further, it gets harder and harder. Not just linearly. It actually gets exponentially harder to stretch this rubber band as I get further and further away from the origin. So this is where it starts, and this is where it ends. This x represents the distance deformed so if we were to think about this as a spring instead of as a stretchy rubber band and I were to draw this out my spring might have some original shape it's only how much I've stretched that spring this change right here this would be X how much distance was my object deformed the same is true for a bow. It might have some original shape, but how much that bowstring stretches, this is my delta x. Let me get these out of here. I feel like these are distracting us. So elastic energy is equal to our stretching is constant, k, multiplied by ooh, 1 half k, actually. multiplied by our distance deformity and these are our three equations for today thanks see you guys next class